Well, good morning, all. Uh, it's, it's a joy to be here with you this morning. Uh, I've often walked by uh, or driven past the entrance to, uh, to, to, to the college here, uh, always uh, longing to, to step in, uh, and this privilege is granted to me today. Uh, so um, what a delight. It has been the ambition of a lifetime. <laughs> uh, and, and looking forward to coming back, uh, but also to hear more of your stories as you open yourself to uh, both your hearts and your minds uh, and, and your lives to sharing this space together of learning and formation uh, to be released in the service of God, uh, hopefully not too far uh, and possibly uh, across the globe as well. So prayers for you as you do so. So, Father, our souls are restless until they find their rest in you. Speak to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Becoming like Christ uh, is a theme that I believe you will be wrestling with, uh, at least for, for this term, if not for, for the rest of, of the year. Uh, perhaps a theme that we wrestle with uh, for all of our life of discipleship. Becoming, like Christ, an aspiration of every Christian. Some of us have uh, attempted to uh, express that in ways that uh, uh, were probably more laudable than others, and some have uh, exposed themselves uh, to um, uh, sort of practical ways of trying to replicate something of what the life of Jesus was like. One such story is that of a pastor who one day gathered uh, his uh, congregation, uh, feeling that he'd been stirred by the Spirit uh, to perform one of the miracles that Jesus had performed during his uh, ministry on earth. And so they gathered uh, across uh, a body of water, and he stepped on, uh, on a boat, uh, at the distance from the congregation, uh, singing praises to God on the shore uh, and prepared to witness uh, the performance of this uh, powerful miracle. And uh, as he had promised his followers, he then stepped out of the boat. One step, by the second step, his body was uh, totally immersed in water. But sadly, where the story uh, is, is not as funny is that uh, that minister could not swim and could not uh, uh, perform the miracle that he was hoping to, to demonstrate and, and drowned. Uh, this is a true story uh, and not a unique story, but a, a, perhaps an expression of what is not intended by being or living like Christ an invitation not to mimic uh, the life and the ministry of Christ, but rather to embody something a bit deeper than that. In our reading, we've heard uh, it seems as uh, if Paul is wanting to offer a vision of what it might be like to live a life uh, centered uh, or mirroring something of the heart of Christ. And the context in which he writes to Philippians is warning them uh, against the Judaizers uh, who were demanding uh, the new Gentiles to convert uh, and be circumcised and conform to Mosaic legislation in order to be assimilated in the emerging community of faith. Instead, Paul argues that Christianity is about what Jesus has done in his life, ministry, death, and resurrection. Therefore, the task of uh, discipleship is not so much one uh, of uh, performance uh, and uh, physical expression of what Jesus had been. None can rely on material or immaterial privileges to claim adherence to the essence of what it means to be Christian. There are no credentials that one can bring to the table that would give them any head start. Paul uses himself as an example to deride those very things that would be perceived as granting him credibility 
and highlighting the privileges that he had. And in our reading, he names seven. Is there a meaning behind uh, that, the use of, of the number seven? I leave that to you and those who are expert in those matters. Uh, so he mentioned uh, religious, cultural, ethnic, ancestral, educational, uh, personality, and moral privileges as things that may offer anyone a sense uh, of adherence, uh, or rather uh, a privilege uh, in their expression of Christian identity. And with all these real advantages, he's able to say that he counts all as loss for Christ. Those very things that were perceived as assets, Paul assesses them as liability because they were keeping him from God. For Paul, the essence of his Christian identity is not assimilation into a particular vision and expression of faith, nor is it relying on a series of privileges to be made right with God. Instead, for Paul, the essence of true Christianity is what he calls the experiential saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because of the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ. Experiential knowledge. To know is to experience. To know is to relate. Cartesian and uh, Enlightenment uh, understanding of life have often reduced knowledge as a cerebral exercise, as an aggregation accumulation of facts, as an ability to, to explain, deconstruct, and re reconstruct specific realities. And in such a defining uh, a vision of personhood that uh, also becomes uh, wholly self-reflective, uh, preventing us to define ourselves in ways that are deeply relational uh, and interdependent. Dangerous to suggest that factual knowledge is not the most elevated form of knowledge, uh, especially in an institution that is committed uh, to the transmission of knowledge. And yet, there is a sense that even our most competent and compelling engagement with the doctrine of the church does not in itself constitute what Paul implies by knowing Christ. In other words, what Paul may be hinting to is the simple reality that one can know the best doctrines about Jesus and yet fail to know Jesus. Now, I probably should uh, hasten to say that uh, this is not a dig on dogmaticians or systematicians. And that probably would apply to every discipline of theology. To know about Jesus is not the same reality as knowing Jesus. Equally, we ought to be cautious of mistaking our ability to, to mimic and replicate something of Christ in our behaviors as an indicator of knowing Christ. Living a good and moral life, while a good indicator is not proof of experiential knowledge of Christ. Indeed, Christians do not have a monopoly on goodness. They don't have the monopoly of the heart, as a French politician once protested. Good moral performance and pious living, though aspired for and encouraged, are not decisive expressions of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to know Jesus. Some of these practices have become absorbed into our societies and have become accepted as norms by which we live our lives. Being a moral person is not the same thing as knowing Jesus. The same ought to be said uh, about our zealous, loving service to the world. 
even our missional zeal that is not rooted in Christ fails to draw others into the orbit of the cross and its redemptive and transformative power. Matthew 23, we hear Jesus uh, chastising the scribes and Pharisees as he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when you become, uh, when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. The Pharisees were doing evangelism, going on mission trips, and yet failed to know Jesus and the power of the redemptive life of Christ. The essence of true Christianity is the experiential saving knowledge of Jesus. And knowledge in a Hebrew mind, and indeed uh, in uh, many cultures around the world, is not essentially uh, a cerebral reality, but a relational reality. Jeremiah 31 reminds us, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their heart, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. There is a sense that uh, God is, in God's essence, a relational God who is committed to reach out to humanity and build pathways that draws each and every one of us in a space where uh, we are invited not only to know something of God, uh, but to experience God in a nearness, an intimacy, in intimacy, and in a depth of relationship. Knowledge is essentially relational. We would do well not to assume that what is personal is equivalent to what is individual. For the knowledge of Christ, my Lord, as Paul would say, mobilizes the whole of my person, but anticipates personhood not merely in an aggregated and distributed term, but in a thread of interconnected and interdependent uh, lives that are woven together with, with the very life of Christ in a life-affirming relationship. To know Christ cannot, therefore, remain an individual pursuit. It is not an exercise in self-actualization. It isn't a quest towards self-discovery or, indeed, a tool for self-help. Rather, it is an invitation into disruptive places, a place of disorientation, uh, inviting us to reorient our whole being, our whole life towards the heart of God. It's a disruption of the received knowledge that to be somebody, one has to lock themselves into a narrative in which human worth and purpose is assessed in categorization and classification that assign worth through quantifiable transactions. We become somebody's only insofar as we are able to extract and exploit resources from others and indeed the rest of creation. But Paul reminds us that a quest for somebodyness cannot be achieved at the expense of the other, but is deeply contingent to the experiential knowledge of Jesus. 
and our somebodyness is best manifested in inter interdependent, regenerative, and distributive relationships. It is beautifully expressed in the Zulu language uh, as it states, Ubuntu, Gumuntu, Gavantu, a person is a person in their relationship with other persons. And uh, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu beautifully puts it as he says, I am because we are. There is a sense in which uh, my knowledge of Christ, my experience of Christ, somehow invites me to become acutely alive and aware of others around me, not as project, but as an opportunity for a relationship. Every encounter, therefore, becoming a gift, an opportunity to learn afresh what it means to encounter God, what it means to offer God, and what it means to deepen and expand our sense of self in Jesus. In other words, there is no expression of Christian identity or Christian experience that is divorced from the reality, more so the imperative of community. We are Christians with. This calls to attention in respect to the landscapes we inhabit. Inhabit us to transcend the fault lines uh, that, so, that carve and shape uh, the context in which we live. And those fault lines that are so easily lead to fragmentation, to conflict, to estrangement. This experiential knowledge of Christ, my Lord, calls me, calls us to labor for the development of a community of faith that is alert, that is alive to the seduction of the humanizing and colonizing forces that so easily enlist, enlist us to follow them. It is a community that is committed to radical hospitality and radical generosity, a community, uh, to, a, a community that is committed to the other as bearing and carrying the fullness of God's purposes, of God's identity, not shaped and driven out of our existential anxiety, uh, but hopefully open into God's future. It's uh, Rowan Williams, the previous Archbishop of Canterbury, who recently, uh, commenting about the, the challenge of the church, was reminding uh, his audience that uh, the vocation of the church is not uh, to call others from a place of anxiety and say, come to church because without you we will die, but instead, uh, come so you will live. I work and serve an institution that uh, has been for a number of years wrestling with uh, its own existential anxiety, concern about uh, the future of many of our churches, uh, whether we will have the financial resources to deploy the people that we are inviting to open themselves uh, into God's calling and, and offer themselves into service to, to the church and to the world whether we will still have the numbers that will justify our standing in society. And out of that place of anxiety, it is so easy to be drawn into a narrative in which our identity becomes essentially performative. And our connections becomes essentially transactional. And where the other becomes uh, an opportunity to to justify and prop up uh, something of our own anxiety. And I would want to suggest that uh, our call to discipleship is not to simply attend to that existential anxiety, but it is to create communities where we do life together, where we recognize that at the heart of our longing at the heart of our aspiration, the horizon we are journeying towards is not one that ensures the future of the institution, 
but rather one that invites us into God's future. And it's a future that speaks of life and life that is boundless, uh, a future that speaks of, of, of reconciliation, uh, transcending the fractures, the divisions, both those that are internal, that are interpersonal, and those that are uh, collective. And that's the future I would like to wrestle for. That's the future I would like to labor for. And I would want uh, all of us uh, to, uh, with enthusiasm, rush into. This experiential knowledge of Christ, my Lord, calls me and mobilizes me into God's future and, and into God's community. And such a community is one in which the, the tyranny of anonymity and exclusion cannot prevail any longer, where all are afforded the, the dignity of a name and invited into a different kind of relationship that is not transactional, but affirming of our shared humanity. And this fellowship of the unlikely, as the New Zealand theologian Kathy Ross often uh, speak of, this community of, of, of unlikely, we are reminded that around the table of the king, we are all God's guests. Guests of God's extravagant and generous love. There around the table of the king, we find life. Their hope is kindled. Their relationship is made possible. There Jesus invites us to abide with him, abide in his love. That means to dwell with all that I am in him. It is an invitation to uh, a total surrendering of self, uh, a total belonging to full intimacy, to an unlimited expression of being with. That is true for those who are exploring their pathway towards Christ, but it is also true for those of us who have been on this journey uh, for longer than we can recall. An invitation that uh, persists uh, and that is repeated uh, daily. A call for us to constantly surrender, abandon ourselves into God so that we may fully experience that sense of being with. And that reminds me of Matthew, the tax collector. Despised, excluded, marginalized, and perhaps persecuted, and rightly so, one might argue, given the way in which, uh, as a tax collector, he lived a life that dehumanized, uh, objectified, and commodified the other and finding himself not only being the subject or the, the subject of exclusion, but becoming the object of that fracture and that exclusion. And so Matthew, the despised tax collector, is invited by Christ to arise from uh, a table of doomed past. The evangelist tells us uh, in chapter 9 uh, that... Matthew, after he says yes to God's call, moving from one table, joins another table. And that is a table not of indebtedness, nor is it a table of transaction, but a table of, of gratitude, of celebration, of joy, where a new community of the unlikely is called together into being and being in fellowship with Jesus. This is a table where friendship and life-affirming relationships are celebrated. Matthew shifts from the table of transaction to the table of relationship, from the table of indebtedness to the table of grace, where all is free, all is forgiven, 
And grace, as we know, engenders gratitude, thanksgiving. And thanksgiving in Greek is the word eucharistia, or eucharistia. As Jürgen Molman puts it, but the ultimate reason for our hope is not to be found in all, at all in what we want, wish for, and wait for. The ultimate reason is that we are wanted and wished for and waited for. What is it that awaits us? Does anything await us at all, or are we alone? Whenever we base our hope on trust in the divine mystery, we feel deep down in our heart, there is someone who is waiting for you, who is hoping for you, who believes in you, who we are waited for as the prodigal son in the parable is waited for by his father. We are accepted and received as a mother takes her children into her arms and comfort them. God is our last hope. Jürgen Mormon adds, because we are God's first love. Jesus draws us into a Eucharistic fellowship, one that finds its meaning and purpose as it gathers around Christ and partakes in the broken body and outpoured blood. It is invited to discern uh, the brokenness uh, of the world through the fracture, the breaking of the bread, as we do it symbolically, and proclaim, though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. This is our origin story. This is where we emerge as a community. This is where the rupture from the past happens and new life flourishes. This is where healing happens, where our humanity is restored, where we're invited to shift from life-denying tables and gather around life-affirming ones. This is our story. This is our song. It is a song that echoes through eternity and speaks of a love so wide, so deep, and so powerful that it reaches to our hearts cutting through obscurity and pouring itself into our lives. This is our story. This is our song. It's the Lord's song that she sings over us, inviting us to commit the words to our hearts to such, in such a way that we are able to then sing those words to others, teaching them the Lord's song. This is what we are called to express as we testify of knowing Jesus. This is not just about head, but it is heart stuff. The kind of heart stuff that gets us to sing with the hymn writer. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. The essence of Christianity is the experiential saving knowledge of Jesus. And to know Christ is more than a factual statement. It's an invitation to shape our life in such an extent that as the world encounters us, all they see is more of God in such a way that God becomes not a distance and an accessible concept, but a palpable reality. So compelling, so attractive, that the world will long to learn from us 
and join in with the everlasting song of God's love. May we learn to sing that song to a world and draw each of our lives and each of our story in a powerful, transforming, and redeeming story of a God who loved the world so much that he invested the fullness of God in that world. Amen.